Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great honor for me to be here today. Just wait a moment. With the sound? Yeah, it's. One, two, three. One, two, three. Can you hear me? No. Okay, good. In all developed countries, blood samples are drawn from the newborn to screen for congenital diseases that will lead to serious disease and suffering if left untreated. The first such disease was discovered by my grandfather, Osbjörn Ferling, in 1934. Norway, we call it Ferling's sickdom. In the rest of the world, phenylketonuria, or PKU for short. It is easy to find excellent reviews on this disease and all aspects of it. As his grandson, however, I will take this opportunity to give a more personal account of his background, his career, and the circumstances that led to his discovery. My grandfather was already retired when I entered the scene, here in 1960, ready to be Christianed. My grandmother, Guri, is holding me and grandfather, Osbjörn, in the back. Osbjörn was born and grew up on a large farm in the middle of the Norway, Trøndelag, where the summers are short and cold and the winters are long and cold. <laughs> One of his earliest childhood memories was from crossing the yard with an armful of logs because it was his chore to keep the kitchen stove with firewood. His mother stopped him and said, today you are five years old boy. That is all that was made out of a child's birthday those days. The children were considered part of the labor force that was necessary to keep the farm going. This was more than 120 years ago, as he was born on the 23rd of August in 1888. Being the youngest of seven, it was his job to be a shepherd all summer. In addition, he would help during the harvest. Maybe that's why he liked the winters the most, because that is when the children were allowed to go to school every second day. In a small schoolroom, all classes together. He cherished the old schoolmaster and enjoyed reading. Eventually, he would have read all the books in the school. And having thus proved himself, he was allowed to attend high school. That was most unusual for a peasant boy those days. The nearest high school, though, was in the city of Trondheim, so he would have to move. But every summer, he came home and helped with harvest. That nearly cost him his life. He would cross the mountain on a self-constructed bike, taking the shortest route following the railroad tracks. He followed them right through a tunnel when the train came. But fortunately, he found a small recess and was left unscathed. The train was not the only danger, though. While uh, in Trondheim, he fell ill with tuberculosis. The doctor prescribed to go home and rest for a full year and added, you are welcome back to school next year, if you are alive, that is. He finished high school in good health. His next desire was to attend the Trondheim Technical College, which had been opened just the year before. This was somewhat reluctantly accepted by his father. But he graduated with a chemistry major at an age of 28. Telling his parents he now wanted to study medicine, his family thought this a bit excessive, but with the help of his brother, they were able to convince his father. He moved to the capital, Oslo, and while studying medicine, he made a living by tutoring other students, and he also worked part-time as an assistant at the Department of Physiology, where he would conduct research on oxygen uptake and excretion of CO2 during muscle exercise. He graduated 34 years old and was employed at the state hospital. I know this is a bit many portrait photographs, but uh, about one every five years, that's all that was taken at those, those years. So this is all that exists. I hope it will pass. In 1926, he received a grant that allowed it, made it possible for him to go abroad, and he visited the US several times. He visited Johns Hopkins, Yale, Harvard, and he also spent some time at the Mayo Clinic. He was invited to participate in an expedition with biochemistry professor Lawrence Henderson, uh, originator of the henderson hasselbach equation, to study oxygen consumption at high altitude. This photograph is from a improvised lab in the Rocky Mountains. The time spent at Harvard and Mayo 
provided the foundation for his doctoral thesis, which was completed in Oslo. As a true scientist, and according to the standards of that era, he used himself as a test subject and reported, I felt a difficulty in breathing, nausea, and skin irritation after ingestion of ammonium chloride. In his thesis on mechanism of ammonium chloride acidosis, he demonstrated the kidney's ability to produce ammonium to rid the body of excess acid. When he later looked back at his scientific contribution, he regarded this work higher than any other and would claim, with tongue in cheek, that this was probably one of the best theses ever written because it was so short. At the hospital, he worked at the medical ward. The patients who were nursed by strict Red Cross nurses in white aprons and starched hats. Grandfather had wanted to work with patients, with the people behind the diagnosis, like he would see his classmates from medical school do. But with his background as a chemist, he was instead assigned with the task of setting up the lab that served the medical wards. Concerning relations with women, the sources are scant. Studies and research probably occupied most of his time. Eventually, though, he got attached to a nursing student, younger than him, with the name of Guri. And after a ball, he is said to have sent a large bouquet of red roses. This was most unusual behavior for him. It was not his style at all. The following summer, she joined him to the Ferling farm was accepted by the family, and they had a small wedding in October of 1930. His lab was on the attic floor in this building. He was known as a skillful lab technician. The director had noted his potential, and a professorate was established. He was working in a lab in this building early one morning in January of 1934, when he was approached by a despondent young mother, Miss Borgny Egelon. She had two children, a girl and a boy. They had seemed completely normal at birth, but they soon showed signs of stagnation, progressing to severe mental retardation. They didn't develop language, gait, or personal habits. In addition, a peculiar odor clung to them. It is in this vial, and I will pass it around. This is that odor. Their father, Harry, he was a dentist. He suffered from asthma, and his asthmatic attacks were aggravated by the children's odor. The young couple had already sought advice from numerous doctors, and their boy had been admitted to the National Hospital, but no one could explain or understand his condition. My grandfather had been one of Harry's teachers while at, medical, uh, at dental school, and the couple thought perhaps he, being a, both a chemist and a physician might be able to find out what caused the strange odor. By that time, Osbjorn had destined himself to a course of laboratory medicine. He did not have clinical practice or see patients, but he would never turn down anyone asking his advice. He told the mother he could probably not be of much help, but he agreed to examine the children. Besides from the mental retardation, he did not find much apart from a somewhat stooping appearance, very fair skin, eczema, and constant restlessness. But the examination would not be complete without urine analysis. And because of the special odor, he suspected they might have a chronic infection of some sort. One of the routine urine analysis was Gerhardt's iron chloride reaction, a test used to detect diabetic ketoacidosis and certain other conditions of the urine. The historical action was to apply a few drops of iron chloride in the acidified urine. Iron chloride does not produce a color reaction in normal urine but gives rise to a deep Bordeaux or mahogany color in diabetic patients with ketonuria. Salicylates and a few other drugs also produce this reddish color. Instead, the urine turned a strong bluish green. He had not seen anything similar before, nor had he seen it described. 
He repeated the reaction to make sure it was not a contamination, and again, the green color appeared. There was another thing left to sit. The green color started to fade within minutes and was almost gone within a quarter of an hour. His first question was, is this reproducible? He asked the mother to collect new urine samples once her children had been several days off medication, herbs, and other treatment that they received. She did, and this time the reaction was even stronger. He realized there might be an unknown dis uh, substance in the urine and determined to try and identify it. Over the course of the following weeks, Borigny Egelon brought an astounding 20 liters of urine to the lab. That must have been hard work, <laughs> especially considering her children were not able to cooperate in the process. To identify the substance, he saturated the urine with sodium chloride, acidified it with hydrochloric acid, and extracted it with ether. Next, the substance was moved back into a water phase with sodium carbonate. He would always know where the substance was, because by adding iron chloride, he would see his green guide. The extraction process was repeated several times, but as it went on, his green guide disappeared, and he was left with a black spot in the bottom of the test tube. He thought perhaps the substance was oxidized by the oxygen in the air and continued the work under a nitrogen atmosphere. This time the substance did not disappear, could be recrystallized, and after one month he obtained neat crystals with a constant mel melting point of 155 degrees centigrade, which is a probable sign of purity. Primary analysis determined the molecular weight of the crystals to correspond with the formula C9H8O3. When oxidized, it produced benzoic acid and oxalic acid. The acids were detected by distillation, and my grandfather would tell about his intense joy when he saw the characteristic needle crystals of benzoic acid gradually develop on the glass wall of the distillation column. After another two weeks, he had identified a compound as a benzene ring with a three-carbon side chain. Could it possibly be phenylpyruvate? He verified this by mixing it with a known source of phenylpyruvate, and the melting point did not change. And that was the proof of the um, type of crystal. The discovery was published in the journal journal Hoppe Celius in 1934, um, also in a Norwegian journal, but it did not attract much attention. In his initial paper, here it's examined by my uncle, he writes, we have found a metabolic disorder in these children that displays itself by excreting phenylpyruvate in their urine. And since I have never found phenylpyruvate in the urine of any other person, and it has not been described elsewhere, it is probable that there is a connection between the metabolic disorder and the mental retardation. What exactly was it that spurred him to go on? In the paper he only states, the urine assumes a transient deep green color following the addition of iron chloride. This appearance prompted me to further analysis of the urine. I believe it was a combination of his education and his personality that made the difference between what could easily have been a spurious observation and a true scientific discovery. He was working alone and with no grants during this period. He did have the advantage of his chemistry background, and in particular because of his thesis paper, he was especially well versed in urinalysis. In addition, there was the human aspect. He must have been impressed with Borgny Eglon's persistence, and he must have pitied her family. Himself having a healthy three-year-old girl at home, who later was to be my mother. This was an intense period of hard work. And talking about hard work, once in his earlier life when catching a ride with a farmer on the way home from school semester in Trondheim, the farmer asked him what he worked with. He told him he was studying at the university. Oh, I can see that from your clean hands that you are not working, the farmer replied. The next year he was called to his second professorate, this time at the newly opened veterinary school. 
He spent 20 of his happiest working years here. He loved the atmosphere, which was a mixture of pioneering biology, medicine, agriculture, and teaching students. And this was also a place where he could keep working on his discovery. One question immediately begged itself. Could there be other mental retarded children displaying phenylpurovate in their urine? To answer this, during the spring of 1934, he visited homes and clinics for the, from the handicapped and collected urine samples from 430 children in the Oslo area. He found nine more patients with the exact same reaction to iron chloride. Now he had a total of 11. Among those 11 were four pairs of siblings and three parent couples were close relatives. So the next question would be, could this close relationship indicate a possible inheritance pattern? Even if the disease must be very uncommon in the general population, it was not at all uncommon in the institutions where one out of 60 patients had this reaction. To find out with more certainty, though, he needed more people or patients, and he collaborated with a professor in genetics and a medical student who was sent all around the country to collect urine. They eventually had 40 patients with a positive urine reaction, just enough to determine the inheritance pattern as autosomal recessive. It was a great satisfaction, of course, to have discovered a possible course of the disease in the Eglon children, but this alone didn't help the patients, nor their families. Finding the inheritance pattern did, though, because that might help in, uh, in um, identify carriers and give genetic counseling. Regarding counseling, Osbjörn Furling, he was a man of great insight, and people would come to him for advice. He used to say, one should not give a person advice without being asked. Me, however, was the exception. He gave me an unsolicited piece of advice that I will late remember and uh, forget. He had purchased a house on the south coast of Norway where he would spend the summers. And here I am sitting in this house between him and my grandmother. I had just learned to swim and was very proud to have made the 150 meters across the small bay where our summer house is located. My grandfather was not impressed at all, probably just very scared and gave me a scolding that I will never forget. My friend who had been swimming with me, she got $5 for, for the same feat. <laughs> the next challenge was to understand where does this phenylpurovate in the urine come from? What is the metabolic pathway gone wrong? There had to be some guesswork in, involved. Phenylalanine was a likely suspect. Normally, phenylalanine is hydroxylated to tyrosine, a precursor of other important molecules. However, what if there was a block in this conversion? The excess of phenylalanine might be deaminated to phenylpurivic acid. Grandfather suspected his patients lacked the ability to metabolize phenylalanine, whereas normal persons could metabolize large amounts maybe carriers of the gene would be somewhere in between. So he set out to load potential subjects with phenylalanine, and it, of course started with himself. He was probably not too happy to discover that his own urine turned green when tested with the iron chloride. The possibility of being a carrier might have bothered him, so he next got permission to load a friend who showed the same reaction. Then he realized the body might not be able to handle the racemic mixture of L and D phenylalanine. L and D compounds have the same molecular form formula, but they are mirror images of each other and are, not, uh, and are handled differently by the body. So we ordered the purified L form from the United States. It was very expensive and had to be paid out from pocket. He reportedly dipped into the family savings to do this. It also took more than a year to get it. But when it finally arrived, it helped strengthen his hypothesis because no longer did his own nor his colleagues' urine turn green with iron chloride. To more reliably test for the carrier condition, though, it would be necessary to measure phenylalanine levels in the blood. In collaboration with a clinical chemist, a bacteriologist, and a biochemist, they developed a test to quantify blood levels. 
What happened next was pure serendipity. They were looking for a bioassay and thought they had read in a paper that the uh, regular bacteria, Proteus, might be able to deaminate phenylalanine. They tested it and were successful. On rereading the paper, they realized they had misread. Proteus was not expected to make this conversion, but in fact it did, and here they have the bioassay. And they were eventually able to determine that a specific oral loading dose of phenylalanine produced a significant difference in plasma levels between carriers and normal people. So consequently, the question of genetic counseling could be answered with a clear yes. The logical next step would be to find a diet for the patients, almost free from phenylalanine. Osbjorn was deeply involved in this and managed to make a pri uh, primitive test diet. However, the first diets tasted real bad. It was difficult for the children to accept and it was a burden on the family to prepare. The ingredients also were not in constant supply. In addition, it soon became evident that brain damage was irreversible within a few weeks after birth. The first successful diet was made by Horst Bickel in 1953, and my grandfather was happy to see the diet working in Bickel's patients. That story will be told later this afternoon. As he was free from call and weekend duty, grandfather was always come home from work punctually. A 42-year-old first-time father, probably he didn't roll around on the floor so much with his children, but he did take them on his lap to read, like he did with my sisters and me, about the three little pigs and the wolf, folk tales and poetry, some of which he himself had written. Here the family is gathered during Easter after the war in 1946. He had been he had a keen but a well-buried sense of humor, and he was a good storyteller. He was attracted by the philosophical authors. I've never seen as many books on Kierkegaard as when we cleaned up after uh, my grandmother and him. And he loved the harmony of Greek art. He would write poems like this one, Ascent, penned into the visitor's book at our cabin one summer during the war. The poem describes climbing the mountain but the underlying message is the war-stricken country's ability to climb its way out through the terrors of war to new peace. <coughs> a fellow professor has shared an anecdote that characterizes him very well. There was a scientific meeting in Boston. The train, in the train were several other scientists going to the same meeting. Full of enthusiasm, one of the passengers entertained his fellows by the story of the great discovery of phenylketonuria, which had been impressed him greatly. And during the conversation, it became clear that my grandfather was going to the same meeting and that he was also a Norwegian. So the first passenger asked, perhaps you know Professor Ferling? Whereupon my grandfather looked down into the floor and bashfully would say, I am him. Reluctantly, he left the School of Veterinary Medicine after 20 years because he was called back to the university hospital to organize a new clinical lab laboratory there. He accepted this because he felt he owed it to his medical background. He founded a school for medical technicians, but when he retired in 58, at the age of 70, he once again went back to the vet school to spend his retirement years. In 1962, he received the Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. Award during a ceremony at the White House. This was the first time the award was presented. It is in memory of Joseph P. Kennedy Jr., who was killed in action during World War II, and is presented for research on mental retardation because one of the Kennedy children was afflicted by a similar disease. Typical for my grandfather's expectations, he had not recognized the full significance of the occasion and showed up in his gray woolen suit. From the Kennedy Foundation, he received this crystal piece with the great Seraph Raphael, mightiest of angels, patrons of science and healing engraved on it. It still adorns the mantelpiece in my mother's home. Osbjorn later received several honors and medals, both in Norway and abroad, the one he cherished the most, though, was the Order of St. Blasius from the veterinary students because it was presented for friendship and for good teaching. 
However, it is said what touched him more than this, though, was a telegram from Borgny Eglon, without whom his science would never have been placed on this track. She is the one who started it, and the first gratitude is due to her. In his retirement years, grandfather would still write, teach, and think. Here he is viewing the famous poster of Sheila and Cammie McGrath, cover girls for the 1961 National Association for Retarded Children in the US. For him, the greatness in little things were as, as important as greatness in big things. And in his gray wool suit, he would meet little retarded children as easily as he would meet the president in the White House. I was only 12 years old when my grandfather died four years after a stroke that tied him to the wheelchair and made it difficult for him to speak. As other young boys, I dreamt about a big yellow truck for my birthday, or maybe a rocket. He had both feet firmly planted on the ground, and he wanted me to have something of purpose. I got this sawhorse, and in contrast to any big yellow truck or other toy he might have given me, this sawhorse has followed me and been of much use in my entire life. In many ways, he was a visionary, seeing possibilities. He saw opportunities and new knowledge, and this may explain why he broke the family tradition and became an academic. He also saw the woes of the future. Already in the 20s, he worried about exploitation of the soil and overpopulation, and he would write about pollution and the sh shortage of scarce uh, elements like, um, like phosphorus. And he was concerned about our lacking ability to renounce. He felt much responsibility for the wor world. He was a very humble man. He didn't like the slogan, knowledge is power, but rather say, knowledge is humbleness. Osbjorn died in 19... 73, 84 years old. He had felt his abilities and strength decrease and thought his mission fulfilled. He was humbly thankful for the possibility of being a doctor and a scientist, a tool in the hands of the creator. He appreciated life, but without fear for death. When my mother asked him on his deathbed if he was afraid of dying, after a pause, he replied, no, but I assume it will be a great change. And those were his final words. Looking back 80 years after the discovery of PKU, we can acknowledge that good science can be performed by a single individual with limited resources and even without grants. Some advances will always have to be costly, whereas others stand right in front of us, waiting for us to stumble upon them. It only requires us to keep our eyes open as we stumble. Thank you.